Welcome back, everybody. You are tuned in to another episode of the Coast to Coast Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Powell. And here on Inside Carolina, we've always got some of the best contributors, some of the best writers, some of the best analysts. And as usual, per the course, per the script that we have from Coast to Coast, I got Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran with me. Rail, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. Good day of football. Uh, Dallas had a miraculous comeback, which was fun to watch. So I'm in a good mood. Shout out to all the Falcons fans that are in misery right now. <laughs> Sean, how about you, man? How you doing? I'm back on the West Coast after two months, so avoided uh, the fires and the earthquakes, but I'm sure some more of those will be coming, be coming our way out in Southern California. But for now, uh, back to the true coast to coast. Yeah, see, we were just lying the last couple episodes. Now we're, <laughs> now we're being real with our audience again. Well, we appreciate you guys being here. Uh, also appreciate everybody listening and watching uh, either via podcast or on YouTube. If you're listening to us on a podcast in audio form, wherever you get that podcast from, stop, take a minute, go rate us, uh, give us your feedback, let us know what you like, what you don't like, because we want to make sure we're providing for you what you want from us. And if we don't hear from you guys, we don't know. We just assume we're doing all right, but we'd love to hear from you and tell us what you'd like to hear more of, less of, uh, and we'll do what we can to try to, to cater the best product for our subscribers. Go ahead and subscribe. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, you'll get everything coming straight to your device as soon as we drop. Uh, you'll be able to be up to date. And, you know, some of these are long form. Some of these are a little shorter, quick hitters. But either way, you'll be up to date on all the news that's pertinent to Inside Carolina. And I would be remiss if I did not give a huge shout out to our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. JohnnyT-Shirt.com. They have any and everything for the Carolina fan with regards to gear, uh, memorabilia, um, stuff to put in your office, masks. Uh, they've really got everything, and they can get it to you quickly via shipping. If you'd rather just roll through town and pick it up, they can bring it to your door. You can't really beat it. Johnny T-Shirt has been side-by-side side in lockstep with us at Inside Carolina for a long time. We want to make sure you guys are taking care of them. So hit them up, johnnytshirt.com. Remember that premium subscribers use the code, get your extra 10% off. They're already amazing prices. With that said, guys, we were all ready to come in here tonight and drop all kinds of news and knowledge and breaking stories and new information. And I feel like I am on remix number four of the same Puff Daddy song. <laughs> and it feels like we're doing the same thing, just uh, throwing in some new audio clips and some new samples. Rel, the only news that's relevant to UNC is that maybe one of their prospects that they had interest in is now going elsewhere. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, so you have like the Timberland mix, and then you have like the club yes. mix, and then you have like the, uh, you know, yeah, the, the Rough Riders, Riders mix, <laughs> where you know they come yeah. in like, and then Locks comes in and cuts like an extra. Yeah, yeah all of that. We're we're on. <laughs> we're now in the part where Puff Daddy has remixed his remix to say that all right, this is what's new when nothing's really changed in the recruiting world. But Rel does at least have a nugget that he can tack onto that. Yeah, so Harrison Ingram uh, did commit to Stanford on Friday. Um, you know, really good job by Jared Hass, you know, who's the coach at Stanford, former uh, UNC assistant for a very, very long time, more than a decade, I believe. Um, and so he's got a top 10 player for the second or a top 10 ish player for the second consecutive class. He actually beat Carolina for uh, Zaire Williams last year. So uh, I know Roy Williams is happy for his assistant, but not <laughs> too happy because he's losing top targets to him. Um, but, you know, we actually did talk to uh, Ingram's dad on Saturday, um, just kind of a postmortem, just kind of say, you know, what, what happened? And um, he had nothing but great things to say about UNC, as you might expect. Nothing but great things to say about Roy Williams. Um, he called him inspirational. <laughs> he said there were a couple of times when, after talking with Roy Williams, where he couldn't sleep just because he was so excited. He's like, I'm a 53-year-old man, and I was just excited. <laughs> I was ready to get up and play for him. He said, but in the end, um, you know, the combo of what Stanford has to offer between academics and basketball, and then Coach Haas. I mean, they really, really believe in him, and they like him a lot. And I think that's what it was. It wasn't so much – um, you know, there were some basketball things that I, I think Sean has um, talked about a good deal as far as Ingram's fit at Carolina 
and um, the players they have on the roster and, and how the roster might look. So that was definitely a part of it. But I think more than anything, it was just they really, really liked Stanford. And Stanford did a good job. They prioritized him, I think, before anyone. And, you know, it paid off. The second straight class where they found kind of a, I don't want to say diamond in the rough, but a, a top 20, 30 guy and turn, you know, who turned into a top 10 player. And they, you know, just got on him so early and stayed with him and won the recruitment. So um, I don't think it says anything particularly negative about UNC, more so just that Stanford did a great job with him. You know, it's a testament to, like you said, to what Jared Hass has been able to do out there. He's pulling, you know, in the last two classes, pulling guys that long-term coaches would love to be able to get, you know, one out of every five years, and he's got them back-to-back. Sean, I know L.A. isn't really close to Palo Alto. Other than that, they're on the West Coast. But do you think you'll have a chance to see, um, you know, see Ingram play over the next year uh, if they come to UCLA, assuming you can get into the arena to see it? And if so, what do you expect to see out of him his first year in college or what assuming will be his year in college? Yeah, no, that's a good, a good question. I think, you know, the funny thing is going back to, you know, once with Zaire Williams, I was able to watch him. I think it was his uh, January of his junior year. Uh, at that point, he had visited Stanford first, didn't sound too enthralled with it, and was sounded really excited about making a visit to UNC. And then come that summer, uh, Harrison Ingram, Stanford was a, once again the first one to recruit him and UNC was starting to be in the mix. And I, I don't know if it was in the Slack chat or probably on here as well, but I said, man, I kind of feel bad for Stanford. And Jared has, they're really, they've really identified these talented players early, and, and now UNC's kind of coming in and, you know, has a good chance at, uh, you know, scooping them up. And both of those, in both of those cases, it didn't, that was not accurate. And Stanford was the first one in, and despite other people entering the fray, uh, they were able to get. So, yeah, in terms of Ingram, um, you know, I've always thought there could, you know, again, a lot, a lot of things can change, but I always thought there could be the potential for him uh, to be in school more than one year. I think Zaire, that's assumed he's going to be one and done for sure. Um, but with Ingram, you know, athletically, does he, you know, does he have that NBA athleticism? Not really, but with his versatility, you know, perhaps that's a selling point uh, come you know, when he's ready to get, get drafted. But, you know, when, when you go to Stanford, Zaire will be gone. Um, and I think they'll give him the keys and he'll have the freedom to play that playmaker role that he does in AAU in high school and have the ball in his hands really from the get-go. So, you know, UNC, I think he would have had a big role, but there would have been, uh, you know, different things to fit around him or him to fit into. And I think at Stanford, you know, most likely he'll have a very prominent role early on. So once again, it'll, you know, hopefully I do get to watch him out here and it'll certainly be interesting to see how he progresses from now until, until then, uh, just because over the summer you didn't really get to get a chance to see, see him in person and would have been able to see him at the Adidas AAU events and then USA basketball, which would have only probably been two, three weeks away. So uh, you know, I, I definitely did enjoy talking to him when we did interview him for Inside Carolina, and we'll be uh, we'll be rooting for him in Stanford. Awesome, that's a good perspective, guys. I want to change gears just a little bit. Uh, Travis Branham wrote something on September the seventeenth that is on the Inside Carolina uh, premium content. So if you're not a subscriber there, be sure you 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 make that change to all our listeners. Uh, but the way he broke it out was there's essentially three tiers of guys in the 21 class that UNC is, a, is involved with. Uh, the top two, and, and he kind of ranks them based on uh, the likelihood of, of them becoming Tar Heels. You know, again, we're not trying to predict anything, but this is, you know, he's taking information just like what you guys have and trying to, to spell it out for folks. And he kind of has this top tier, which is Salas and Dunn which we've talked about ad nauseum the last couple of uh, last couple episodes here on Coast to Coast. Uh, then there's Trey Kaufman and Caleb Houston. And then there's some other guys that are, you know, you're talking about um, Price and Chet Holmgren and Smith. Mm -hmm. Tobias right? Smith. Yeah. And Patrick so, Baldwin. Yeah, Baldwin. I don't know where I'm getting Price mm -hmm. from. Um, but uh, Jabari Smith and Patrick Baldwin at the bottom. So – We've kind of talked about Salas and Dunn quite a bit. Is there any news there, Sherelle, that, that you can think of that we need to update folks with? Or are we still kind of just, you know, watching for commitment watch one way or another? 
Yeah, I think Dunn's still commitment watch. Um, that I still, I used the word imminent two and a half weeks ago, and I still think it is. Um, it just still very, can be. Yeah, just a loose <laughs> definition of imminent. Um, I, I still think, you know, in the next couple of weeks, it it could be tomorrow, it could be the next couple of weeks, but I think he's very, very close to um, making slash announcing a decision. You know, I think Salas, a lot of people thought he was going <clears> to <throat> wait a little while, um, but with the visits now, the NCAA announced that there will be no on-campus visits um, until at least January 1st. And I just know that there are people around him who want him to go ahead and, and get this done. And there are people around him who thought he'd be much further along in this process than he is right now. Uh, so I would anticipate him making a decision. Um, you know, it, we're only two months until signing day. Yeah. I think he's definitely a signing day or before um, kind of uh, announcement. He's nothing's going to materially change between now and signing day. So it's either do I want to take my recruitment into April or do I want to go ahead and, and finish it up and sign a letter of intent in November? Um, so I, I would anticipate him making a decision, you know, within the next, I don't know, month to six weeks. Um, sure. Uh, you know, and he's been to Gonzaga, he's been to Kansas. So those are really the only, and Nebraska, which he cut from his list and Creighton, which is still on his list. Um, so those are the only places that he's visited. So in all likelihood, if you believe kind of what, everyone's hearing behind the scenes that it seems to be Kentucky or Carolina, then he's going to end up likely committing to a school that he didn't visit, which is again, for this 2021 class, very, very, very unique. So um, I think that's where he's at. Uh, I would say a decision the next, you know, six weeks, maybe. And then I think done is any time now. All right. Well, I appreciate that, that update for our listeners and our viewers. Um, Sean, you wrote a really good, uh, column called the fit that's on the premium message board right now about Trey Kaufman. Uh, I think there were some really good nuggets in there. What would you like to share with, with kind of your profile on Kaufman and, and what you think he might bring to wherever he ends up in college? Yeah. So I was able to, I think that was the final one for the 2021 class. Um, and for, for him, I mean, he's a guy that uh, I would have loved to have seen in person over the summer, uh, just given some of his strengths and weaknesses and seeing how they, they translate. And it was really over, I guess, yeah, last weekend, I was able to go back and watch some of his high school full game tape um, versus a lot of the stuff I think everybody else has seen has been the AAU highlights, uh, maybe some extended highlights, uh, but it was really good just to kind of see the full game. Uh, so his misses, how he moves off the ball. And, you know, I think for him, there's there's a lot of lot of upside, and I kind of noted um, another Trey Trey Lyles in terms of who his game reminded me of. Not at that same level because Trey Lyles was a legit kind of top ten, fifteen, five star his whole time, plus a little bit bigger. But in terms of uh, his style of play, you know, he's listed at six eight, six nine, so kind of fits the size of a power forward. But um, he can, you know, he's very comfortable on the perimeter. He has a good shot. He's comfortable in the post. Um, he can take people off the dribble, but it's more of when he has mismatches. So if he has a bigger guy on him, that's where he's going to be prone to, you know, taking the, the ball off the dribble. Um, if he has a smaller guy, he can bang in the post. He's really big. You know, if he does catch the ball in the post, kind of a few dribbles, either a kind of a mid-range jump shot um, or kind of an up and under. So he's, he definitely ha is very fundamental coming from Indiana and has kind of an old school versatile game, which is what I always thought of, of Trey Lyles. So in terms of his game, that's, you know, offensively, he's, he's I think versatility is the main thing. Um, in terms of projecting him, if he were to end up at Carolina, you know, once again, I think from a five position, a big position, they'll, they'll it'll be pretty crowded. You never know if Armando could leave or, or maybe Dayron or, you know, maybe one of them is one and done. Um, in terms of the four, I think that's that's going to be the open spot. So are they going to be playing in a too big, you know, a true too big system? Um, I don't see him coming in from day one and starting, but I do see him potentially coming in and having a big impact, um, especially since there is so much up in the air about playing style and who he could play next to. But once again, he's, he won't be a one and done player. Uh, but he could be a very talented, maybe two to three year player. So that was kind of a lot to unpackage, but I'm very interested in him. But I do think UNC has kind of an uphill battle given some of the, 
uh, pre-established local schools that have made connections early on. Yeah, and if nothing else, we've seen that Roy Williams is able to do a lot with seemingly a lot more as far as total net benefit of the program with those guys that are there two or three years as opposed to somebody that is a one and done, um, just strictly from a player development standpoint. Um, so we've kind of gotten through what the, 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 the warm and the lukewarm UNC prospects are. I'd like to change things a little bit, and let's talk about this coming season for UNC, specifically around the roster, but mainly about the news that broke this past week. Uh, Greg Barnes did a great profile on it uh, about what this schedule this year is going to look like. So to, to rehash that, uh, what they determined, uh, the NCAA determined that the season was going to start on November the 25th, which is, as we were talking before we started recording today, 10 years ago, that was normal, right? <laughs> that was pretty close to what we were used to. But uh, starts on 25th. They've got 42 days uh, beginning on October the 14th to get 30 practices in. And the most of uh, games that you can play is 27, including one MTE, as Sherelle told us earlier. Abbreviations are key here on the Coast to Coast podcast. Uh, that is a multiple team event. So something like the Battle for Atlantis or the Maui Invitational, which is now going to be in Asheville, or whatever it is that Duke decided they didn't want to play in in South Dakota. Um, all of those things, you can get up to three games out of those, but that you can only do one of them. So that's kind of what the new schedule is going to look like this season. And I want to ask you guys, and Sean, I'll start with you. Uh, how do you feel that the current guys on the roster, specifically some of the young guys who you know, just got to campus this past summer, how do you think that's going to either benefit or hurt them with the new schedule the way it is? Uh, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, really where you're going to be very dependent on freshmen, uh, with definitely Caleb Love and, and RJ Davis, you know, I would say the late the, or the pushback start would give them a little more time to get comfortable with the UNC system, um, and the practices. I think it's going to, you know, it, and, and I guess another thing is, you know, you look at Garrison Brooks. So every team would love to have a Garrison Brooks returning uh, just from a, you know, an output perspective, as well as he's been there four years. So I think him being there kind of offsets the youth of the guards. Uh, but I do think uh, kind of the pushback pre or I guess pushback season will give the guards a little, a little bit more time to get acclimated. Um, you know, they're not going to have as many games to get acclimated in. So maybe come, you know, December and January with ACC season, it's still, you know, a little bit rough, you know, rough sledding. But right. at the same time, you know, if you're, you're going to, you know, say UVA early on or, you know, on the road in the ACC, you're, most likely the, the crowd is not going to have a significant advantage if there is any crowd, depending on where you go. Um, so I think it'll still, it'll, it's going to be very interesting, especially given everybody that UNC is adding uh, the year they had last year. But once again, I think having, having Brooks back is, is huge. And then, um, you know, once again, as we've talked about really all spring and summer, a lot is going to be put on the freshmen on their shoulders and hopefully they can adapt pretty quickly. Shrill, I'll throw the same question to you, but specifically, uh, you know, you, UNC has, uh, has some players that have been dealing with some injuries I look at a guy like Anthony Harris, and I'm wondering, you know, is, is this pushback, will that, I would think, help him, right, as far as getting some more reps, getting some more time on, on that repaired knee? Uh, so I'll throw the same question to you, too, but also, you know, what do you think about a guy like Harris coming back from, from a, a pretty devastating knee injury last year? Yeah, so the, when he tore his ACL the first time in high school, it was December of his senior season. So I guess that would have been December of 18. Um, and then he tore it again uh, January of this past year. So it would have been January 2020. So basically a year um, from when he tore it the first time to when he came back and played for UNC. And I, I think from all, by all accounts, what we heard, we talked to his dad um, earlier this summer, that you know he's he's close to ready and, and they think he's going to be ready by the time the season starts but as you mentioned that's just another couple of weeks you know you push back now you're at almost when the season starts basically 11 months from when he tore it um back in january so that's a, that's a pretty good amount of time to recover from acl i think most people say you know like nine to 12 months for that um but you have to remember even though he's played in four games, he's still basically a freshman too. Mm -hmm. So Caleb Love is a freshman and RJ Davis is a freshman. And it's just going to be a very unique season for 
I mean, for obvious reasons, but if you think about it, <clears throat> what better year to have a team with freshmen as guards than this year? Mm-hmm. Like Sean said, you know, you don't have to worry about 20,000 fans yelling at you when you go on the road. You might have to worry about, you know, 15 or 20 parents or whatever, you know, yelling at you, but that's about it. You're used to that, you know, in AU games and high school games. Um, you're basically living in a bubble. I know that the NCAA doesn't want to call it that, but you're not going, you shouldn't be going to parties. If you are, you know, you're out of compliance. You shouldn't be going to parties. You know, there's no one really to hang out with. There's nothing recreational really to do um, except for go to class online, go to the gym and get shots up and work out and lift weights and condition. I mean, besides that, I, I don't really know what else there is to do, honestly. I mean, you, you can't, I mean, there's nothing else to do. It's, it's, it's college Hashtag on my grind. Right? Yeah. It's, it's college, <laughs> it's college, it's college basketball without the college essentially. Right. Um, which brings us to a whole nother topic, but none of the distractions are there. So, you know, they're not going to have to deal with all that stuff that most freshmen have to deal with when they first get to UNC. Um, and then as far as the season goes, I would imagine when the schedule comes out, games are going to have to be spaced pretty well apart so that, you know, you it's unlikely anybody's going to be playing on a Thursday and then a Saturday just because you have to get tested and you have to go through protocols and all that good stuff. So the t- wear and tear on their body isn't going to be what it usually would be for, fre- for a lot of freshmen where you're going Wednesday, Saturday, you know, Wednesday, Saturday, Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, yeah. you know, that kind of cadence. There's four games think, in like 11 day. Week yeah. Yeah. I, I would be surprised if that, I could be wrong, but I would be surprised if the schedule sets up that way, just because of everything that was required with COVID. So it's going to be very unique. And some of the things that, you know, all the Carolina freshmen in history have had to deal with, they're not going to, but you know, on the flip side, they also missed out on summer pickup and being yeah. there when Williams has his Carolina basketball camp and, some of the things that you would want and you go to college for, they missed out on. So while there are some advantages on the court, there's so much stuff off the court that they missed too. So how do you anticipate this helping uh, some of the young guys? You know, Sean mentioned it, you mentioned it. This is going to be a very heavily driven uh, youth backcourt, youthful backcourt, young backcourt, whatever it is I want to say. But there's going to be a lot of youngins handling the ball to start with for UNC. How do you think they approach these extra couple of weeks or this delayed time from a coaching standpoint? How do you think they they try to work these guys in? Well, we talked to um, Bobby Frazier a few weeks ago for a weekly scoop about this topic, about, you know, how will will Roy Williams, you know, coach his team without fans? He was like, he's going to do what he always does. They're going to run and they're going to rebound. What he did say was, though, with with the freshmen, I think – you know, just they're going to run up and down the court. They're going to go really fast. That's what Roy Williams wants, Roy Williams wants them to do. So it's not, it's not going to be a, a huge difference, really, in, in how the, you know, they approach things and how they run their offense or, or anything like that. Um, it, I, frankly, I just see a bunch of positives, you know, especially for someone like Caleb Love, who's the presumptive starter at point guard or at lead guard. Um, you know, he's, he's just not going to have those things to worry about. And I, I think it's a, it's a really a positive thing to come out of, you know, all this, that the year that North Carolina is going to have freshmen predominantly playing in, playing in the backcourt, they're not going to have to worry about some of the distractions on and off the court that, you know, they typically would. So Sherelle is going to be our optimist tonight. Uh, Sean, <laughs> I'm going to throw something to you. You don't have to totally take the other side of the coin, but I do want to ask, what does this do for recruiting? I mean, we mentioned the dead period has been pushed back to January 1, or I'm sorry, has been extended to January 1. Now you've got the college schedule that has been pushed back. How is this going to tie into the way coaches are currently evaluating? Because we've said in the last two episodes of Coast to Coast here that it's just really been weird. How do you think, knowing now that this, the season's going to start 1125, these are the windows you have to start practicing on October the 14th, what does this do for a coaching staff as far as figuring out how else are we going to finish out 21 and how are we going to look towards 22? Yeah, I, I mean, I, that's a great question because especially with UNC and, and Roy Williams, you know, it's, it's usually, you know, around now the open gyms are occurring. So they're, they're out and about uh, really crisscrossing the country in, ter- in terms of what Coach Williams and the, and the coaching staff, where they go. And then, you know, you enter in, usually the preseason and, and really I feel in that November, December timeframe, uh, especially once you get closer to finals is where once again, Roy's pretty much out on the road every day of the week. Um, you know, and he's even turning over some of the practices to coach Robinson 
et cetera. Um, and then you're not going to have, you know, midnight madness, you know, midnight madness for really bringing in some of the star recruits or some of the younger talent in the area. And then, uh, you know, as the season goes using some of those, the big games as once again, one of the key things about UNC is just getting people on campus and seeing the Dean Dome and the, you know, 20,000 plus fans in the arena. So it really changes things up. Uh, but I think it gives the coaching staff one more time, you know, more focus on the, the players, uh, which I think they'll definitely need with so many freshmen coming in. If UNC is able to land some of those kind of top targets in 2021, that makes things a little easier. If they don't, then, you know, it'll be interesting to see, do they, once again, start offering other players? Will they be waiting for the spring in terms of maybe some decommitments or the grad transfers? Obviously, we saw how that played out last year, but I think with how this year is going to go, there'll probably be an abundant abundance of other transfers to be looking at, um, you know, next year. But once again, I think if they can land some, you know, whether it's a Salas or, you know, I, I, you know, Dunn, I, ideally a Salas and Dunn, but if you can land one of those top prospects, you're feeling a lot better and you can focus a lot more on the current team. Yeah. And I'll just add, I, I told you guys, I was going to say this every single podcast until, you know, they're allowed to go see guys again, but we're getting to a point where there's not any film left, you know, the last, <laughs> it's I'm all been watched. Keep, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna keep hammering this home. The last time these guys played competitive basketball, like really competitive basketball was in March. And if you're a 2022 player, yeah, you might've played some tournaments over the summer, but it's just not the same as it would have been if you were playing EY Bell, EYBL for Nike Adidas or Under Armour. And so <clears throat> if we're assuming that, you know, guys are able to play in January and February, it's a whole year without tape. That's a whole summer and fall. The fall evaluation period would have started last week uh, that Sean was talking about. There's just a long time for guys to develop on their own. So even if you do have tape on a guy that you like, we should stop saying tape. Even if you have digital recordings of a guy <laughs> that, you, that you like. Beta maxes of a guy. Right, that, that you saw in March. Who knows what he looks like now? He could be 30 pounds heavier. He could be 15 pounds lighter. He could have grown six inches. He could be completely different from the last time you saw them. So I think that is something to keep an eye on, too, is that the evaluation was already hard for 2021. And it's just going to get harder, uh, you know, for 2022 until some of the stuff starts changing with, with the virus. And, you know, none of us know when that's going to happen. So, yeah, it's, it's insane because if you think about some of the, I guess, you know, top notch prospects that have come through in the last 10 years or so. I always think about a guy like, like Anthony Davis, who was a point guard until what his summer after his junior year. And he grew how much and became, or maybe, maybe I'm getting my timelines off, but he grew a substantial amount into the, you know, the five that he is now and is ripping up the NBA. So I'm, it's gotta be tough for, for these coaches to just guess, I guess, and, and try to do this on the fly. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed by how much of it continues to change. Sean, one more thing before we kind of head home on this episode. Do you want to preview a little bit of, of what some of the, the potential pieces could be in 22 and how they might play into to UNC's hands or how they might be appetizing for, your, for UNC? Yeah, and, and one, one other quick thing to add before just on the subject we were just talking about, in terms of, you know, both myself and Sherelle have, been able to go to a lot of summer events over the years and I think the one thing you will say is how hard UNC does work uh, during those live events you know oftentimes you see teams you know from the head coach to the assistant coach leaving a day early um, you know kind of checking out towards the end especially in, in the summer and UNC is you know that's one of the things that they love to do is always being out and always getting to the events and then once again open gym so I know they really obviously rely on the, the in-person viewing. And once again, it just makes things that much harder. So the people that are more disciplined right now, uh, we'll see how that turns out over the, really the next, next year or two, just given you're not going to have really those guys that are maybe number 70. And now all of a sudden with a few good AU tournaments, they're number yeah. 18. Um, but in terms of going forward, so you mentioned Trey Kaufman and the fit. So, as of now, that wraps up the 2021 class. Most of it, you know, we kind of finished that part of the fit a while ago, and 
just to uh, confirm this last week. Uh, so now 2022, Sky Clark will be uh, first early this week. Uh, just right before we got on here, I, as Sheryl mentioned, I was going, you know, I was watching some Atlanta Celtics highlights um, from recently, but I had to go back to when he was in Southern California and some of his sophomore year tape just to, once again, try to get a little bit better of a, a feel for him. So currently in the mix of watching a game where he's going against two other uh, five-star rising juniors as well. Um, but yeah, so he'll be out early, early this week and then kind of go to Jaden Bradley and Mitchell and, and Andrews. And, and then um, we'll see, hopefully there'll be, be some more coming up in, in either of the classes. Some more offers to discuss, hopefully. Look, as I know we've said it the last couple of episodes, but I honestly think that at some point time is going to run out and things are going to have to change, right? At some point offers are going to go out, uh, players are going to commit, Coaches are going to have to adjust. Like, think it can't just continue to be this status quo for so long. I'm, I'm not, I'm not making things up by saying that, right? <laughs> no, you're definitely not. I mean, I think, you know, once again, going back and watching the high school games, the Trey Kaufman in Indiana, and the the Sky Clark, and just seeing the fan, you know, the stands just jam packed with people, and <laughs> you know, just thinking how. <laughs> how quickly and how much things have changed uh, since, since then. Although it has been good to watch football and, you know, watching the Cowboys and seeing at least a few fans in the stadium. Um, so that's been good. But once again, at least as of now, basketball is on track and hopefully that uh, will continue. Well, so I, hope, I hope there's no need to have you guys' faces superimposed <laughs> at an uh, EYBL tournament in the near future. Hopefully we can get back to eventually – seeing guys in person. Rel, what were you going to say? I had one thing, and just going off script a little bit. So, Sean, I, I know you've been watching some NBA, too. And, like, the offense has been pretty incredible. And I haven't seen really any reporting or anyone try to explain why that is. I think the most common thing is, like, oh, the sight lines are easier. There's no travel. Those all make sense. Do you think, you know, these are the best conditioned, you know, athletes in the world, and it's at a completely different level from college basketball. But do you think that in a bubble type scenario, which is more than likely um, for college basketball this season, that we'll see the offensive kind of explosion that we've seen in the NBA as well at the college level? That's a great question. Uh, that is a good, a good question. Um, it, I can go either way, to be honest, because, you know, watching the football games and the NFL has done a really good job of just focus on the field. So you kind of lose the fact that, there's no crowd there, but then when they do do the end zone shot, you kind of say, man, like, how are they really getting up for this without – start. You know, yeah, just without the energy. Um, so, I, you know, I think with the, the college kids, I, I might even lean towards defensively. It might have a little more, little more impact um, in terms of, once again, you always talk about playing in the – in the you know the the domes come the final four and how does that impact the sight lines and you know maybe now you're playing in these you know instead of these high school gyms you're playing in these 10 15 20 000 arenas that for the most part are pretty pretty silent um so i guess i'm not going to really be able to answer <laughs> answer to that but I, I think it is a good question i mean the nba has done a, a great job that's been fun to watch i mean obviously the style of play is much more different where you know, the defensive three seconds and really you run a few pick and rolls and you can either get to the rim and you, you have a layup or you're taking a, you know, a, a three from the corners of the wing. So I still think defensively it will be a little more, uh, at least early on, a little more focused. Um, so I don't think you'll be seeing kind of the ridiculously high scoring events, but, <laughs> you know, with the NBA, it has been fun to watch as you see Tatum and, and Brown and, you know, Brandon, some of these guys didn't go to UNC, but they were guys that we all got to see in person early on. And, you know, now really five, four or five years later is, is now where they're, they're kind of peaking. Um, Bam Adebayo has been one that I've loved seeing him dialed in. Yeah. Yep. Marcus, uh, Smart, Marcus Smart is hitting threes, which is yeah. like. <laughs> what world is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, and I know we're, we're going to close, but so full disclosure, I'll tell you how the sausage is made. Joey asked me something earlier and I completely forgot what I was going to say. And I was like, okay, I'll just give him an answer until I can remember what it was. So what I was going to say was, is that I think it's really important for each team, you know, we're talking about Carolina. So for Carolina, they need to have like, 
designated hype man or energy guy or something. Because as you watch college football, you watch the NBA, even the NFL, you can see at times where guys are kind of just going through the motion. They're like, this is really weird. Like I'm out here playing hard, but I'm not that excited about it. And if you notice, I I think some of the teams that have done well, like I watched Miami a ton. I watched the Suns a ton in the bubble. Um, A couple of the college football games I watched, the teams that are kind of into it, they just have a little bit of an edge. And I think that's something that's important for UNC. Now, North Carolina isn't typically known for having guys who are boisterous and very (laughs) animated, you know, over the course of Roy Williams' tenure. But I do think Garrison Brooks, that's where, like, having experienced guys like Brooks and Leaky Black, um, who have played a ton, Sterling Manley, even though he hasn't played a lot, he's been around, you know, he's there, play tech, those guys can really help with that, in that you're going to have to self-start, you know, you're going to have to be able to get yourself up, because playing Carolina, you know, playing in Cameron with 500 people, it's going to be much different than it would be any other time. And you might have waited for that your whole life and been thinking about it. And when you get there, you're kind of like, man, this is, this isn't what it was advertised. And it is, you just have to, you have to bring that energy yourself. So I think that's going to be really important that, um, and I think the coaching staff will kind of hammer that home is you, you have to be into it from the start because no one's going to get you excited other than, you know, it's these, 13 guys, the three coaches, these are the only people who are going to get you excited and get you energized. So you have to be prepared and, and, and get yourself ready to play. Yeah, I think one, one thing to add on that is, you know, when, you, when they start the practices, I, I do think, you know, it would be really fun to be at the practices and one seeing how they're dividing the teams, the white and the blue. And with all the freshmen coming, there's going to be a lot of depth. So, you know, really, besides for point guard, you're going to have people challenging – challenging each other at every single position, uh, which will be great for the team and and obviously the depth going forward. But, you know, you mentioned Bobby, Bobby Frazier. And, you know, when he was a sophomore, he probably started longer than people expected, um, you know, just because he knew the system and he knew how Roy wanted to play, uh, despite Lawson, you know, one of the quickest guys I've ever seen just itching, you know, itching to start and itching to play. And I could see, you know, a guy like Playtech uh, maybe playing a more instrumental part early on. You know, not a a huge part, but I could see him, uh, you know, with his experience and with the things that he knows how to do, uh, potentially probably, you know, probably playing more early on and then seeing how things develop. But, you know, when you talk about a lot of inexperience at the guard spot, that's where it could benefit some of the other guys as long as they're able to, you know, play at a high high level. And in those battles, you know, if it, if it's a situation where two guys are, are basically the same and they're trying to find something to differentiate, maybe it's energy. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just how into it you are, you know, it, because it, it's just going to be so different. And I think they might lean to guys who play with that passion and with that energy, even though some of the best players in Carolina history maybe didn't do it. I think this is a year that maybe that is something that gets brought, you know, brought up and, and it's something that they look for. And that's the guy, you know, Harris, once he gets back, because he was the guy when he, when he was in last year, you're like, man, this guy is, he, get, he really gets after, he really plays hard. Um, so I think once he gets healthy, he can definitely play a part of that. Well, I think we've given enough of a tease to our listeners to now they can actually start thinking about it. You know, we've got, we've got a start to the season now. It's starting to get real, kind of like it happened with football where, you know, okay, we've got a date on the calendar. We can start moving towards it. We can start getting our hopes up. Uh, I, I hope that this is a little better uh, start to a season than, than football has been for the Tar Heels from a sense of being able to play the games that are scheduled. And I do think smaller rosters will help. But I think you guys have hit some really, really good points about how the team will prepare knowing when the start date's going to be, knowing how they're going to acclimate some of the younger guys and get them up to speed. And I think you guys have brought some really strong insight uh, to the show tonight. So I appreciate that. Um, want to thank everybody for listening. Want to thank everybody for tuning in. Make sure you check out Johnny T-shirt, johnnytshirt.com. Give them a big shout out. Thank them for supporting Inside Carolina and the work that we do. Use your premium subscriber 10% discount. If you're not a premium subscriber to Inside Carolina's content, get with the program. Uh, is that a little harsh? Maybe it's a little harsh. I don't know. Go do it. How's that? Become a subscriber. Also subscribe to all the uh, Inside Carolina Network podcasts. Get all the stuff just like this episode of the Coast to Coast sent to you as soon as they get posted. But we appreciate you guys joining us this week on this episode of Coast to Coast. 
we will be back at you in, uh, in a couple of weeks, if not sooner, depending on what happens with, with news breaking and things changing. And hopefully, hopefully we'll have some really uh, juicy tidbits to discuss relatively soon. But I want to thank Sherelle McMillan, Sean Moran, as always. We'll catch you guys on the next side. Thanks.